I love our church. Our church is so unique. It's unique because I think our vision, it's not unique, but we're sold out for our vision. GMI's vision is to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen? And how awesome is that? Basically, you know, there are some churches out there that their vision is that you get a bigger house. That's a fake house church, right? But our, our church's vision is that you would sell your house and go on mission. That you would sell your car and go pursue the purposes of God in your generation. And that's something that's beautiful, I think, in the sight of God. But also, the people are different. The people at this church are different. You are different. And if you are here in this sanctuary right now, or tuning in online, you could have chosen to do anything else, but within you there is a hunger and a desire to do the will of God. Can I get an amen? Now, with that being said though, hunger is one thing, but preparation is an entirely different matter. For example, you could be hungry for the word of God, but if you have no desire to prepare, no desire to work, you're no better than just a fat slob, okay? Like imagine someone who just eats all day. It's great that you're eating, but if you don't exercise, come on somebody, uh, you will be even more unhealthier. And I pray that that is not the condition of our hearts. It's good that we desire God's word and desire to do the will of God, but are we ready? Everyone say, am I ready? Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Are you ready to do his will? And sometimes I feel like, God, if you would just show me your will, you know, if you just tell me, I'll do it. I remember uh, this past week, I was walking with my wife. You know, we do a lot of walks. We're not, we're not runners yet, but we're walkers, right? <laughs> Praise God. And so we do a lot of walks, and we're walking with our children, and we were talking about like an area in our life that we wish God would reveal to us. And I said to my wife, you know, Mina, if, you, if God could tell you everything about what his will is, both the good and the bad, come on, and even the ugly, would you want to know? Now, let me ask you that question this morning. Show of hands, if God could reveal everything to you right now, how many of you guys would want to know? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, amen. Yes, faith-filled people in the room, but we are the minority. <laughs> There's only a few of us. My so my wife, I asked her, would you want to know? And she said, mm, no, I wouldn't want to know. I said, why? You know, you know, why would you want to know? And she said, it would be so discouraging. And I was like, oh, why, right? And we were just talking and she said, but you know, also, I want to, I want to walk out and, and uncover things with God. And I was like, oh, wow, it's so spiritual. You know, like, <laughs> so great. But for me, I was like, I want to know everything. You know, I want to know God. It, am I supposed to be here? Am I supposed to be in India? Am I supposed to be in Afghanistan? I want to know everything. And then as I said that to her, we're walking, and the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me and said, would you really want to know? Because the Holy Spirit brought me back to when I was an immature single guy. And he asked me the question, if that Sam could know the difficulties of marriage, of children, and all of this, would you have decided to marry? And boom, I was like, oh, shoot. Because I wouldn't have married. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I, prob I probably wouldn't have. And that's the reality. That the reason God doesn't show you everything is actually you are not even ready to receive it sometimes. And that is because within us, there is sin in our hearts and a desire for self-preservation. That sometimes the desires of God for you obviously are good, but it goes through treacherous journeys oftentimes. And if you knew how treacherous the journey would be, would you really want to know? And that's really what I want to get at this morning. As we read into God's scripture, we're going to see the Apostle Paul dealing with some opposition as it comes when he desires to do the will of God. So turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. And we're going to alternate the reading. And I'm going to read the odd verses and you can read the even. And we're going to read until verse 12. This is the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 21. Now when we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos. And on the next day to Rhodes and from there to Batara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for the ship was to unload its cargo there. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey, while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. 
After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we boarded the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and after greeting the brothers and sisters, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As they were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And he came to us and took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns the belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Amen. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit to do the will of God. And in his desire to do the will of God, he's facing several confrontations, several obstacles, several roadblocks. The reason, I, the reason the Holy Spirit led me to choose this passage, I believe, is because we all have a desire to do the will of God. There's not one person in this room that says, I don't want to do his will. That person is not a believer, and you need to accept Jesus Christ, and I can talk to you, and I hope that you accept him. Okay. <laughs> Judging from some of the awkwardness, there are some unbelievers in the room. It's not a joke. We want you to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, everyone wants to do the will of God, but are you ready to do the will of God. Because those who desire to do the will of God will face obstacles of many kinds. And the obstacles that are found in the text this morning are actually things that on the surface are very good and might catch you off guard. And so we're going to look at some of those things to really examine for us, what are the things that are holding me back from fully pursuing God in my generation, from giving myself complete access to the Lord and doing his complete will? The first obstacle that we find in the text are the disciples themselves. In verse 4, it says that the disciples, led by the Spirit, told Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. And in verse 12, after after the prophets declare the word, they beg him, don't go to Jerusalem, with tears in their eyes. Every one of us has what we would call a community. Everyone in this room has a community. Even if it's only one person, you have a community. And a community is not defined just by your intellect. It's defined by your heart. It's the people that you're emotionally connected to. For example, you can have a father in your mind, but if your heart is not really connected to him, it's hard for you to have that same relationship. Just like how if I were to look at my wife right now and I would say, you are my wife in whom I am well pleased, that's not really a relationship. That's not really a community, but my, she is not only my wife in my mind, but she is in my heart. Amen? You know, I love you. Okay. Our community is defined by our hearts. We are attached in our hearts. I just feel led to say this. If you are not attached in your heart to this body, I'm sorry to say, but they're not quite yet your community. It's just a place that you worship. But Paul here was very attached to these disciples. He found them. He looked for them. Everywhere he went, he discovered where they were and went to find them, and they also to him. They looked at the Apostle Paul, not just as a Bible teacher, but as a father, as Apostle Paul says. You have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. This was a community that God gave to the Apostle Paul. And yet, isn't it interesting that the very community that God gave to Paul is the very community that is harassing him? Or should I say the community that is hurt by him. Beloved, there are times in our life when we choose to do the will of God that will put us at odds with the people that we love. Oftentimes, God leads us to assignments that are difficult, not only for us, but even for the people that we love. When you make a decision, that decision doesn't only affect you, it affects everyone around you, especially those who love you. And those who love you I'm sorry to say, but sometimes can be a hindrance to that passionate desire to pursue God with all your heart because it pains them. You know, it pains them. They don't want to see you in pain. They don't want to be in pain. And so oftentimes when God leads us to do things, it puts us at odds with certain people. And that's not a bad thing. That's because we're connected with them. You know, I remember when I was uh, in high school, I decided to shave my head. 
I know, it's very foolish. I could have used some of that hair right now. But I decided to shave my head for whatever reason. And I remember I was doing it in my backyard with, uh, you know, a non-believer named uh, Joe. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're shaving my, our heads. And then my dad comes home and watches this. And he is furious, all right? Um, in the Asian Korean tradition, apparently shaving your head is a sign of rebellion. He thought I was, like, basically renouncing him. Well, it doesn't make sense at all. I'm shaving my head. He's furious. And my grandma walks out, and she begins to cry. <laughs> Why would you do this? <laughs> and she starts crying. And my dad, in his anger, is like, look at your grandma. How, how could you break her heart like this? I was like, dude, I just, it's just hot. You know, I just want to shave my head. <laughs> the reason for that is every decision that we make affects our family. It's not just for us. And I can imagine the Apostle Paul, when he said, I am going to Jerusalem, they're all crying. I can imagine they're like, you're, you're, you're making Sister, Sister Edith cry, you know. <laughs> you're, you're making baby Ruth. Baby Ruth, what did she ever do, Paul? Why are you making her cry? And I can imagine that it was such a difficult decision for him. What I'm trying to get us to see is that these decisions to serve the Lord, it's not made in vacuums. It's made in the context of very real relationships that will be stressed because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the reason God does this is because he wants to see your allegiance to him above any primal relationship that you have. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, anyone who does not love father or who, does, who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's not mad or he's not angry that you love your father, you love your mother, or you love your child or, or even your spouse. He is disappointed when we choose to love them more than when we choose to love Jesus. And can I say that these are very real things that are happening right now. Even in your own life, many times the decisions that we make, we often think, how will this affect the people that I love the most? And what if, beloved, the Lord would guide you into a season that you are to choose him over your children? Him over your spouse. Are you ready for that assignment? You know, there is a reason when uh, um, (laughs) when Pastor Shine came up and he said, "We're doing a we're doing a fast. We're doing a media fast." Oftentimes, that whenever I hear media fast, it's always what we don't get to do, right? When when someone says we're doing a media fast, it's always, "Oh man, I can't watch the latest, uh, you know, the latest episodes of my favorite shows or the latest movies." Or my friends, you know, my real friends. They're only my friends. I can't, I can't hang out with my friends. Instead of, oh, wow, this is an opportunity to hear from the voice of the Lord. How, oftentimes when we think of what we lose, that's because the sin in our hearts is attached emotionally towards that thing. And actually, when we love our children more than we love Jesus, more than we love him, we're actually doing our children a disservice. We're actually creating an artificial reality that their lives are meant for their own and not for the living God. Can I get an amen? Did you know the greatest thing you can do for your family is to love him more than the family? Because as you love him and as you pursue him, that righteousness, that desire, that passion, though it causes pain temporarily, will lead to a life of victory and glory in the Lord. Amen. Love your, love your parents. Love your children. But love the Lord more. And Apostle Paul had to overcome this obstacle. Can we go a little bit deeper? Now the obstacles are getting higher. The next obstacle that we see in the passage are the prophets. Prophets are no joke in the Bible. They write scripture. They're able to warn the believers of what is to come. They literally foretell things of the future. In fact, one of the prophets that we see here, Agabus, he proclaimed that there would be a famine in the land. And the whole body was so encouraged that they prepared for that. How many of us would love to have known COVID-19 was going to come two years ago? How, How awesome would that have been? Pastor Sean comes up, by the way, there's a pestilence coming. Man, there would have been so much peace. Don't you agree? I remember my uncle and I were talking, and he was like, if I knew COVID-19 was going to go this long, I would have just moved to Hawaii for two years. I would have just had so much peace. And that's because prophets are powerful instruments, people of God who proclaim the truth of God in every season. 
But the prophets here didn't get the word wrong, but they were a hindrance to the work of the Apostle Paul. And it brings into question this tension. Why would God not only bring apostles or disciples, but people who are gifted in the Spirit? And why and how are they at times an obstacle to my desire to do the will of God? And the reason is, there are times that I've seen in the body of Christ where giftings can replace authority and leadership. Where giftings can actually replace unity. And here's what I mean by that. Just because somebody is gifted by the Lord does not give them authority in the Lord. Just because someone has the ability to proclaim the word of God in a manner or which that is incredible in the signs of wonders does not give that person immediate authority over your life. And beloved, you would do well not to submit yourself. Come on, just because that person is gifted. Hello? Imagine if the worship leader were to come and tell to Pastor Shine, you know, Pastor Shine, I'm such a better singer than you. You know, I, uh, I, I can dance better than you, and you know, you, your voice is not that great, so I'm going to be the senior pastor, right? You would be like, get that Satan out of here, right? Or imagine a security guard goes to the chief medical officer of a hospital and says, you know, I've been at this hospital longer than you. I know all the doors. I know all the locks, and today I'm going to be the chief medical officer. Or <laughs> for the sake of the example, imagine my son, a beautiful boy. One day comes to me and says, you know, Dad, you're a poor pastor, and, you know, I make ten times more money than you, and uh, today I'm going to be the father. I would beat that boy (laughs) in his beautiful behind till kingdom come. Just because you're gifted, just because you have an ability, it doesn't give you, it doesn't usurp authority. And I see this all the time in the body of Christ where people go outside of authority, even the word of God, to follow people simply because they have a teaching gift, they have a healing gift, they have a prophecy gift. And if that happened here, we could have made big mistakes. What you're seeing in this passage is the tension between the prophetic gifting and the office of an apostolic leader. Whenever there is tension in this place, it simply is to reveal the condition of the heart. And I believe here the Lord is trying to get us to realize that we must rely ourselves, we must submit ourselves always to spiritual authority. There are times, I mean, I I could talk about this for years and years. I remember when I was in high school, we were going through periods of revival And God was using me in a powerful way. And I remember there was like one service. I was praying for someone, and they fell back. I was like, oh. I was like, oh, right? I was just like trying. So I was like like going around. I was like trying to lay hands on people, right? Suddenly, I'm like, wow, Prophet Samuel. (laughs) I remember I walked home as a high school, you know, I was like, you know, the prophet is here. (laughs) You know? And then my mom would just be like, hey, go clean up your room. And I'd be like, you know? beneath my office. She's like, you false prophet. Nah, you know, like she was like, she beat me so hard. And Hans <laughs> you know, my, my mom. That's the reality. You know, when we think we're gifted, somehow we think we don't need to submit to spiritual authority. We don't need to submit to spiritual leadership. We're like, hey, you know, God spoke to me. Isn't that what happened to Miriam and Aaron? They were both like, hey, doesn't God speak to us? Isn't that what happened to the sons of Korah? They were like, hey, doesn't God speak to us? Isn't that what happened with the, with the seven sons of Sceva? Hey, we don't need to submit under Apostle Paul's leadership in the church. We could just do it on our own. We have the name of Jesus. And they were sorely beaten and they were sorely ashamed. Beloved, there are times in our lives where we must overcome even the obstacle of thinking that just because I have a gifting that I can go about without spiritual leadership. And that's something that we have to examine. And that was something here that I believe that was being tested in this place. Are you willing to submit to? I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later in the message. The third and perhaps the greatest obstacle is not only the disciples, not only the gifted disciples, but actually it could even be God himself. In verse 11, interestingly, the prophet Agabus, who was a sincere prophet, heard from the Lord, was tested and proven, said, this is what the Holy Spirit said. Agabus did not even say, this is what I think. He said, this is what God thinks. God said, in this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. 
One of the greatest obstacles that you can face when it comes to desiring to serve the Lord is when God gives you an assignment that seems out of his character. Now, God is good. Can I get an amen? God is a good father. He will never lead you into sin. But there are times where the Lord will lead you through a treacherous path. Just think about the Israelites. When he told them, go march around Jericho, that was basically certain death. When he told, when David was inspired to go fight Goliath, that was certain death. When Jesus was being delivered to the cross, that was certain death. And so there are times that God will lead us to scenarios where it is all but certain that we're going to fail. Would you obey? If he told you, I want you to get up and I want you to start a company, but know that your company is going to fail, would you obey? I want you to get up and be a part of this ministry, but it's going down, and you're never going to get any payment out of it. Would you obey? They were saying, this is certain, Paul. This is a certainty of failure, certainty of pain. Would you obey? Why does God do this? Why would a loving father do this? It's because he wants you to know him. Not theoretically, but experientially. When he, told, when he told the Israelites, you will know me as the God who delivered you out of Egypt. The reason God puts us in Egypt, the reason God gives us an assignment that seems so treacherous is so that you would know him as your deliverer. Can I get an amen? That you would know him as your savior. That you would not just have an experience of God as just the God of the Bible or the God of of Egypt, or the God of Israel, or the God of Pastor Shine, but that you would say, you're my God. The reason he takes us through hardship is so that you would have a testimony to share that God, even in the midst of the valley, I have come to know you're my Savior. Can I get an amen? Are you in a situation right now of a crisis? The Lord has led you there so that you can know who he is. Can I get an amen, church? You know, sometimes I think we need to be thankful And we need to approach these situations that the reason he leads us to a treacherous journey was so that we can know him more, know his goodness, know his power. How many of us need that testimony? You know, oftentimes when we we counsel a brother or a sister, sometimes we're so quick to say, hey, you know, go get some counseling. You know, oh, hey, you know, why don't you go and... Or rather, if we had the testimony in our heart to say, what the Lord did to me, he can do to you. Can I get an Amen. Can I tell you two weeks ago, my whole family got COVID and we're all healed. Can I get an amen? God has healed me from COVID. My children, all of us, we all got COVID and I was ready for the Lord. I was, I said, Lord, now would be a good time for you to come. Now, now, Lord, now. But he brought me through that season. God is the God of healing. Can I get an amen? He leads you through treacherous assignments, not to fail you, but so that you would see the glory of God in your life. Beloved, if you are in an assignment where you feel like there's nothing but failure, it's not failure he wants you to experience. It's the glory of God that wants to be revealed in your life. Amen? But why would God then, and the last obstacle here, speak in a way that's confusing? It seemed confusing. The disciples were confused. Maybe even Apostle Paul could have been confused. Because it seems so clearly that Apostle Paul had a desire But everyone else was not affirming that heart. Apostle Paul had a conviction, but there was everybody else that was hearing different things from the Lord. And there are times in our life when God speaks in mysteries. And it's so frustrating, isn't it? I wish, God, you would just tell me who to marry. Oh, my God. Let's just avoid all this dating app and all of this. Just tell me, God. Oh, God, I wish you would just tell me what church to go to. God, I wish you would just tell me what company I should work for. I wish you would just tell me. Anybody, I wish you would just tell me in the house of the Lord. God, I wish you would just tell me. There's a reason he does that. There's a reason he does that. The disciples asked Jesus, why why don't you talk to people plainly? Why do you always have to use parables and you always have to speak in ways that are confusing and watch Jesus' answer to them? He said, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not hear because their hearts are far from me. 
What Jesus is saying is the reason you are confused, come on somebody, the reason I am not speaking so plainly to you, come on, is because your heart is not pure before me. The reason we have confusion in the word of the Lord is not because there's something wrong on his end, come on, it's because there's something on my end that's blocking me from discerning the will of God. The Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. And the word also says that the pure in heart will see God. It's not difficult for them. But when our hearts are not pure, it's so hard to discern the will of God. Why is it that there are times in our life where I feel like, man, I just don't understand what God is saying to me. I don't understand what this preacher is saying. I don't understand what the Bible is saying. It's because your heart is not pure before the Lord. The disciples, Jesus, just speak honestly. Don't use parables. Don't use figures of speech. Just speak honestly. And Jesus said, their hearts are not right. Uh, Okay, Jesus, their hearts are not right, so just speak honestly. Just speak honestly. Jesus says, their hearts are not right. Because if Jesus spoke honestly, the person with the wrong heart would reject the message of God, and that would be a greater judgment than not hearing at all. Listen to what I'm saying. The greatest judgment upon your life is to hear God clearly and to reject his word. And the reason why you are confused could actually be a measure of grace that God put upon you. To get your heart right before him so that you don't commit the greater sin of rejecting the word of the Lord. Woo! Come on, peace, Sam, you better preach it. The reason God is not speaking to you clearly is because your heart is not right. And the heart is the most impossible thing to figure out. In the book of Jeremiah, it says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? There are times when I think I'm doing well in my heart. And you you are the last person to know how your heart is doing. There are times when we, sit, we come before the Lord and we're like, oh yeah, God, why don't you speak to me? Well, he's trying to show you kindly. Your heart is not pure before him. It's so hard to know how our hearts are doing. There are many times when we're standing before the Lord and we say, yeah, I, I felt like I've cleared my heart and given it everything to him. Well, if you were pure in your heart, you would understand easily the will of God in every situation. And so therefore, the reason for the confusion in your life, the reason the word of God is not so pure and easily discernible is because there's something there that needs to be dealt with in the Lord. So brothers and sisters, what is the answer? It's not trying to figure your heart out. It's to come before him and plead the blood of Jesus over it. Lord, plead the blood of Jesus over this heart. God, I can't even see the blind spots. I can't even see the specks. You have searched me and you know you're such a perfect God. You know deep down, maybe I've hidden some sin deep down. And so I can't know and I'm, it would take years of therapy and years of spiritual direction. But in one prayer, hallelujah, the blood of Jesus can wash us and be pure before the Lord. Can I get an Amen. The disciples were not pure before God. The prophets were not pure before God. They were anointed, but they were not pure before God. The reason for this conflict, I believe, is that within the disciples, there was a desire to keep Paul with them rather than releasing him to what God's purposes and plans are for his life. They were, I mean, was, I could sympathize with these disciples. This is the only father they had. I bet you in their mind they're thinking, well, if Apostle Paul dies, what's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to our community? If he goes and suffers, doesn't that mean they win? And I can bet in their hearts, their hearts were torn. And even though they were coming from a place of love, they were speaking an incorrect word. But the Apostle Paul shows us in verse 13. He says, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul shows us that he was ready to not only be bound, but to die. In other words, the Apostle Paul was prepared in his heart and in his mind. He was prepared with an unshakable mind and an unmovable heart. He said, I'm not only ready to be bound. 
See, you guys are only focusing on one area of hardship, but I've gone one step further. I have made, I have gone through every scenario in my head, and I have discovered it's still worth it to follow God and to fulfill his purposes for my life. Beloved, have you gone through every scenario in your head as to what you will count the cost to serve him, and is he still worth it in you? Is he still worth it in you? Is it, still, is it still worth it to pursue God in your generation even if you don't get the answer prayer? Even if you don't get the job assignment? Even if you don't get the healing? Even if you, don't, even if you fail? Even if that happens? Even if your finances go? Even if you don't get to choose your job? Even if, watch this, you don't get to even choose the role, the thing that will fulfill you the most is, are you ready to give it up for the Lord? The Apostle Paul was ready. And I believe this is where the enemy wants to play in our hearts. Because every place that in our mind that we are not ready to surrender everything for the Lord, that becomes a playground for the enemy. You see, like you can come to as many services as you want and surrender and come before the Lord and say, I give you everything, I give you everything. But if there's still a part in your mind that's not ready to give your finances, Satan still has a foothold right there. You can go pursue God and run after him. But the moment he tugs upon this leash, back here, that back to that place you are. If there's a place in your mind where you're not surrendered fully for your own family, you can, you can experience the wonderful power, the anointing of God But as soon as you go there, he can play right there and bring you right back. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of Satan playing with my life. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of Satan playing with my church. I'm sick and tired of Satan playing with my community. I am tired of it. Why? Because the Bible says that we are not only to judge the world, but we're supposed to judge angels. Did you know that in the last days when Jesus comes back, you're sitting on a throne looking at Satan for what he is? A filthy little animal. Hallelujah. Aren't you tired of Satan messing and stealing your joy? Making you afraid, bound to fear, bound to being immovable for when God is saying, I want to use you to experience the glory of God. Paul was saying, you know, everything that you guys are saying, I'm already prepared in my mind. I'm already ready there. Praise God. He said, I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die for the name of Jesus. What he was showing was, I've already played every scenario in my head. Everything that could go wrong, and I'm saying it's still worth it. Because my heart is still connected to the radical worth of Jesus Christ. That his name is worth me losing my life. That even if God doesn't deliver me from this present predicament, his name is something that is beautiful and worthy of a life poured out. Apostle Paul was in love with Jesus. He wasn't doing this because he had to. He wanted to. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, he was having his heart being broken by the disciples. But his heart was here in this place to say, Lord, your name is worth it. Beloved, what is there in your heart that's not worth losing? to gain for God's glory and for God's fame. So how do we know this was the will of God? How do we know this was the right call? Well, there are two things that happened as a result of Paul's decision. The first comes in the verse uh, 14. It says, when we heard, when we heard that he would not be persuaded, we said, (laughs) we became quiet. We said, let the word, let the will of the Lord be done. Can we put this uh, verse on the screen? And since he would not be persuaded, we became quiet, remarking the will of the Lord to be done. Maybe right now you're going through a place where there's a lot of confusion and turmoil, even among your family who know the Lord. One of the ways that we can discern that this was truly the will of God for our life is that there is a peace that comes upon it. There is a peace, a stillness. 
that after the disciples, hey, we all made our confession, we all said what we had to say, but at the end of the day, yeah, this is from God. And that, is, that peace is from the Holy Spirit. He's the same Holy Spirit. And though the desires of your heart may be all over the place, when the Holy Spirit speaks, it's always something that brings peace, not fear, not doubt, not confusion. God is not the author of confusion. He brings peace. And the second thing that we know is that the fruit of that decision. Paul says this in the book of Philippians chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The fruit of Apostle Paul's decision to suffer for the name of Christ was threefold. It advanced the gospel. Hallelujah. It brought a testimony to the imperial guard. The people that were embounding him, the people that were imprisoning him, they were receiving the testimony of Jesus Christ within them. They were watching Apostle Paul. This is no common criminal. We've been around criminals. We know if you're guilty of some punishment, but we see this person and he's testifying of Jesus. He's living, he's living this peaceful life. And the third thing the Apostle Paul says is that it brought courage to other people. That suddenly all the brothers and sisters and believers who are watching Apostle Paul suffer, suddenly in their heart, there is a courage that arises in their heart to say, if Apostle Paul can do it, then so can I. You know why I love GMI? Because we have people in this congregation. We have people who have gone before us that have counted the cost, that have been prepared in their mind to suffer whatever it is to give their life for the gospel. And can I tell you, their life can do a far greater job at encouraging us than a preacher can. When somebody lives their life fully given to the purposes of God in their generation, they can do more to affect change in a culture. Oh God, I pray that you would give us a generation of people who will love you more than they love their life. Oh God, I pray that you would give a generation of people who will count the cost and make ready in their mind and in their heart to be unmovable and unshakable in their land in Jesus' name. Beloved, the Lord is looking for servants like Paul among us as well. That what the Apostle Paul did was not unique. He was only following his master Jesus who was ready to go to the cross Scorn the shame so that we can be saved. At the end of your persecution, at the end of your trial, at the end of your difficulty, there is revival on that other side. There is history to be made on that other side. There is glory to be experienced on the other side. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to surrender that to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm quite tired of seeing the culture degrade. I'm quite tired of seeing my friends lose their faith. I'm quite tired of living a life where Satan has a stronghold in my life. I'm ready to give it up. And if you are too, I encourage you to stand to your feet right now. Come on, let's pray.